The gospel text for this Sunday is taken from John, chapter 3, and we're going to be taking a look at the first 17 verses. There was a man from the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform these signs you do unless God were with him. Jesus replied, truly I tell you, unless someone is born again, another translation would say above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. How can anyone be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked him. Can he enter his mother's womb a second time and be born? Jesus answered, truly I tell you, unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh, and whatever is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I told you that you must be born again. The wind blows where it pleases, and you hear its sound. But you don't know where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can these things be, asked Nicodemus. You're a teacher of Israel and don't know these things, Jesus replied. Truly, I tell you, we speak what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but you do not accept our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated as we go into the word today. This is a, a text that Jesus is focusing on the spirit and engaging with Nicodemus. He throws out the teaching that you have to be born again first to see the kingdom and you have to be born again to enter it. And in Nicodemus' frustration of being able to understand, Jesus then begins to talk about the Spirit. And the Spirit of God is, is something that I believe is much more difficult for us to wrap our minds around than, say, Jesus. Much more difficult to wrap our mind around than God our Father. And so we tend to kind of not focus on him as much. But today I'd like to focus our attention on what Jesus is referring to with regards to his spirit. Remember, he's baptized by John and the spirit is there in the form of a dove. And then the spirit leads him into the desert. And in the Gospel of Luke, it is the spirit that when he returns from the, de the desert, he has power from. And the Spirit continues his entire ministry, and then Jesus promises to give his disciples the Spirit. And understanding that more today is, is the goal of which I hope um, God can use the message that, uh, that we're going to go into today. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for, for gathering us this morning and thank you for your spirit we would not be here were it not for your spirit and so as we gather in your name this morning as specifically as we go into your word please open our hearts and minds to hear what you have to say as you so perfectly say it this we thank you for praise you for trusting you for 
In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to start with just the first part of the verse. First part of the chapter, rather. There was a man from the Pharisees. Stop right there. Pharisees, we don't necessarily, unless you've done some study, understand what the Pharisees were about. The Pharisees were a group of people that have collectively agreed upon, if you will, various customs, practices that were intended, were intended to be godly and holy. And as such, they very much stuck to those practices with a vehemency and almost an obsession that defined who they were. They had as a practice certain foods you could eat, certain foods you couldn't eat. Now, a lot of that's biblical because it was given to Moses, but they took it a step further and a step further and a step further. They would not use dishes that Samaritans have used. I mean, you could only, you could wipe down or you could uh, only use certain kinds of dishes. They had to be wiped down in a certain way. They had to be placed in a certain way. They had to be stored in a certain way. The, the list went on and on. And, though, and so they carried with them, if you will, a very stringent adherence to symbolic practices. I'll just let that sit for a second. It, it wasn't scriptural. It was symbolic of what was in the scripture, but it wasn't scriptural. And the intention was to somehow be able to live in this presence of God or the kingdom of God by adhering to these practices. The thing is, when Jesus came into his ministry, he was not trained in Phariseeism. And he never used Phariseeism to exercise the Spirit's power. He used the Word. And therefore, from the moment that he started his ministry until he was crucified, there was the conflict between the two groups, or Jesus and this group. And so, Nicodemus goes to Jesus and says, first of all, he has to go at night so that he can not necessarily be recognized. Doesn't want to be seen doing what he's doing. And he immediately addresses Jesus saying, you know what? We know you're of God. All of us do. None of us can do what you're doing. Not one of us. We've got the robes. We've got the, well, in our modern day, we've got candles. But there's no power. It's symbolic of the power. But there's nothing there. And we've got people that are really into it and really adhere to it and are trained in it. But, but Jesus, there's no power. We don't have it. And immediately when Jesus begins his ministry, the first thing he begins to do is cast out demons. And the first thing that he begins to do is cast out the demons and the unclean spirits of those people who are in the church. Oh, you didn't hear me. Because nobody has unclean spirits in the church or in the synagogue. And that's, they're blown away. Whatever that unclean spirit was of shame, of fear, of religious pride, it goes on and on. But he begins to cast out unclean spirits. He begins to heal the sick. He begins to do things that they just can't do. And it's a baffling scenario for them. Because they were trained to adhere to these religious symbolic practices. I use the word symbolic. Because that's what they were. 
We have symbols all about a cross. But a cross isn't going to save you. A cross isn't even going to help you. What Jesus did on the cross is another story. And this is a, this is a very delicate reality that we have to deal with because we are unable to perceive spiritual truth in the physical. We can see things in the physical. We can see if the church looks nice or pleasant or religious even. But we can't see the different spirits that are around us. We can't see, we can't see who just came in and is dealing with shame or guilt or whatever it is that they're dealing with. We can't see that. So that goes unseen. But Jesus could. And so as Jesus is, is demonstrating these signs, Nicodemus, who is one of the, of the Sanhedrin, which is the highest, he's a doctor degree, let's put it that way, comes to him and likes to say, have a few words. And he says so. Rabbi, we know your teacher has come from God. No one can perform these signs you do. What's up? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, or truly I tell you, unless someone is born again, cannot see it. And of course, this is, this is baffling. But it's not going to be the first time. It is not the first time that Scripture refers to this being born again. Another translation is being born from above. And to be born is exactly the terminology that describes and relates the reality of the power of the gospel of God. Peter says it this way. This is uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, verse 23, but verse, start with verse 22. Peter says, since you have purified yourselves by your obedience to the truth so that you show sincere brotherly love for each other from a pure heart, love one another constantly because you have been born again. Not of perishable seed, but of imperishable. 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, John writes this. Everyone who has been born of God does not sin because his seed, God's seed, remains in him. He is unable to keep on practicing sin. It's not that you're never going to sin, but you don't practice it as previously. And that word in verse 9, because his seed, that word in Greek is sperma, which means it is God's seed within us. What God has done through Christ is what he is doing within us. And God himself comes to Mary and says the Holy Spirit will come upon you so the one to be born from you will be the Son of God. His nature is going to dwell within him. God's nature, that is. And this is the gift that God gives to every single believer the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to us first by hearing. Hearing the gospel. I can't tell you how many times I have heard a number of people said, I've heard the gospel, I heard, or I grew up in church, and I didn't hear the gospel until, and then they say something. Now maybe they went to a church that it got caught up in various things and they really didn't hear it for clearly or maybe they heard it clearly for the first time. I don't know. But it is through the word of God, through the hearing, that the Holy Spirit first comes in and in some way, in a supernatural way, supernatural way, begins this transformation. You hear the gospel. You hear the message that God created the world. God created you for a purpose and that sin has separated us. Disobedience has become our nature and as such we are in many ways enemies of God. But God in his mercy has sent his son and whoever follows him and understands and believes that he has been crucified for our sins 
died and resurrected and now has given us his spirit. That message, even if there's an inkling of truth in it in terms of what you believe, that's the beginning. Now, that's the inception. That's the inception. Being born simply means that you come into a reality. In the same way with the physical, physical baby is conceived. But the baby isn't born until the baby leaves the womb and enters into this world. And usually when that happens, it's a terrifying experience. That's why they scream. I mean, who wants to go from this nice warm bed? What is this? Freezing cold. All of a sudden, look, you don't have to breathe right now, but when you get into the, this other reality, you're going to have to breathe. I don't want to breathe. It's not a mistake that the Spirit of God is referred to the same word as breath. Because we learn how to live in the same way that a human being cannot exist in this world without learning to breathe, we cannot live in the kingdom without learning how to live according to the Spirit. And this is what baffles Nicodemus. We're doing everything right. None of it's scriptural. It's developed, it originates in man, these customs. And therefore, because it originates in man, it may be symbolic of the kingdom, but it has no power. There's nothing there. It looks good. It has the appearance because it's symbolic of the kingdom, but it can't heal anybody. It can't cast out anything. It can't transform anyone's soul. It can't hear or heal anybody. It can't do it. And this is why he was so perplexed. Why is it that you, you don't do any of this? How do you get this power? And rather than answering the question, he begins to promote what Jesus always promotes, the kingdom. Unless you're born again. Now, there's a lot to be said here. You can't talk about the Holy Spirit in one sermon. It's just way too much. Suffice it to say that without the Spirit of God, all religion has is symbolic practices, which will go nowhere. You got banners and whatnot, and depending if you're really high church, sometimes you have choirs and all that stuff is good. But there's no power. And the power that we see, this is very important is the Word of God. Last week we talked about Jesus' temptation, that he was tempted. He was in the, in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights, and when he came out, he was tempted. And the first thing that the devil did is to tempt him with doubt. And Jesus' response is, in all three times, it is written. Now you have to think about that for a second. Because Jesus did not have a Bible with them. They didn't have them. They didn't have books. They had scrolls. So in order for him to know the word, he had to memorize it. He had to digest it. He had to feed on it. Which is why Jesus says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. You have to eat it. Jeremiah says the same thing. I've eaten his words. It means it becomes your, not only the foundation of your life, but over time it becomes your greatest passion. You can't get enough. How many of you are passionate for food? Right? Hmm have that same kind of passion for God's Word? Is it easier for you to invite someone out for lunch or to come over and share a Bible study with you? Is it easy for you to invite someone out for dinner or to invite someone over to spend time in prayer? And the Spirit of God 
will, as he continues to grow, as he continues to grow with it, because just like in the, just like in, in the physical body, you don't come out a full adult. You gotta figure out what's going on. And just like a child starts going, what's that? What's that? What's that? What's that? Same thing with the spirit. Begins to give us discernment. That's why Jesus says he will remind you of everything that I've said and will lead you into all truth. This is the, this is the journey that we're on. See, our faith is not limited to this world. It's eternal in scope. The flesh is focused entirely and solely on this world and this world only. The spirit is not all that interested in this world. Jesus says the spirit is life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words that I speak to you, they are spirit. They are life. But some of you don't believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe. Just because you have a crowd of people that are gathered in a church doesn't mean they all believe. Some people like a social club. Nothing wrong with a social club. But there's no power in a social club. No one's going to come to Christ with a social club. The power of God is not going to be released into a world that is in desperate need by symbolism. It can only come by the Spirit of God. Only the Spirit of God. And this is what God, this is what Jesus rather is referring to when you said you must be, and he uses the term, the word, I'm sorry, water and the spirit. I tell you the truth, unless someone is born of water and the spirit, water baptism is simply a public declaration of an oath. That's what it is. It is committing oneself wholly, completely, fully, 100%, no holds barred to the Lord. That's what it is. It's a military, in some ways, oath. When you join the military, you don't join it Monday through Friday. Well, war broke out on Saturday. I'll get to it on Monday. And that's generally how the enemy works, too. When we least expect it, the enemy will come in and wreak havoc. So this is what Jesus is referring to, in essence, as he's talking about being born from above. God's Spirit comes into our lives, into our very being, into our mind, into our spirit, into our soul, and begins to go to work. It's like, as Jesus refers to with the different parables, it's the seed of the sower. It comes in in seed form. And as such, it needs to be tended to. It needs to be cared for. That's our participation. We need to give time to it. We need to nurture it. We need to spend time with God. The enemy will do anything he can to keep you from the word of God. He will use busyness. He will use distractions. He will use, oh, this would be fun to do. And now all of a sudden you're doing fun. And when was the last time you took a trip? and you had a Bible study every day on your trip. See, now, people said, said to me a number of times, sometimes I think you need to go on vacation. You know what happens on vacation if you're not careful? I don't read the Word. And it sounds crazy because that's not how vacations are promoted. I'm supposed to have fun. There's nothing wrong with fun. But it cannot compare with the Word of God. Show me where it says this is about fun. Oh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's tantalizing. The devil is so good. So good. And so when we are looking at this, at, at this text today and living by the Spirit, it is much more than a parable. We don't want to get this confused with a parable. This is a spiritual truth regarding the Holy Spirit, of which, by the way, in the Gospel of John, uh, Jesus talks about very pro uh, profusely. 
more than any other gospel. I will send you the Spirit. I'll give you another counselor. He will be with you forever. I will not leave you alone. I will send you the Spirit in that day. I mean, he just goes on and on talking about the power of the Spirit. And he says something very profound. The Spirit's like the wind because you cannot see the Spirit. And when the Spirit moves, one must be able to move beyond the symbolic practices and follow that movement of the Spirit. And the book of Acts is testimony to that. Moving beyond one of the things that Peter, of all people, experienced was sitting on a roof meditating, meditating and praying, and a vision came to him. And the vision, if you remember, was the sheep that came down with the unclean animals. And this guy was a very devout Jewish man. And I'm not eating anything that's unclean. And God told him directly, don't call anything unclean that I call clean. And it was the beginning of an outreach to the Gentiles that has resulted in you and I being here today. Because he moved by the Spirit and not symbolic, empty practices that the Pharisees were very, very learned in. There's a lot to be said with regards to the Holy Spirit and now is not, I mean, we don't have the time to, to get into all of the things that Jesus talks about the Spirit. But this is the first, this is the first in the Gospel of John that will continue throughout his entire Gospel, that we move by the Spirit. And the Spirit can be so foreign that the temptation is just to not delve into him. Not, not, not get to know him. But he wants to know you. And he wants to introduce you and me to the fullness of Christ. And more than that, he wants us to introduce other people to Christ. In closing, Jesus says to his disciples in the Gospel of John later on, when the Spirit comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify. That's a powerful thing, to be caught up in the Spirit of God. But that's what um, this, this chapter, John 3, 1 through 17, begins to relate to us. That the Spirit is alive and at work. Alive and at work. I've been doing a Wednesday morning Bible study with a number of men at uh, Starbucks. And I want to know their story. Because most 20, 21 year old men are not in a Bible study. Tell me, how did the Spirit get a hold of you? And every single one of them has a story. And it's that story that has the power of God as we continue to grow. Your story has the power of God. Our collective story. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your faithfulness. Your spirit truly is like the wind. We have no idea where you will go and that can be very scary. Truth is, we have the entire year planned out for you, Lord whether that meets your agenda or not we don't know but please teach us and guide us so that we like all of your children can follow your lead as your spirit leads us and this we pray in Jesus name Amen